prison doors. He parted the raging seas. My God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We walk quiet. We shout at your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We walk quiet. We shout at your praise. Shit! 
man. I hope that you guys, if you came in this morning and you're like, ah, I'm just kind of still tired. Anybody in here tired? Okay. Hopefully you'll, you'll get a little bit of shot in the arm today, a little bit of a boost of adrenaline, because when we're in, 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 in this place together, gathered together, we have an opportunity to be reminded of how good God is and what he can do in each one of our lives. And that's what we celebrate today. You know, you will probably never, no matter who you are, no matter if you're someone who, who's a follower of Jesus or someone who's just checking out faith, you will never know how much the God in heaven loves you and how much and what lengths he'll go to to pursue you in your life. So whatever you're going through today, be encouraged by that. See you. 
Thank you so much. The words of this song, a reminder to us of the lengths you'll go for us, leaving those that are safe, pursuing after the one that is lost. God, help us today to recognize that, that you pursue each one of us. Help us to find you here. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, turn to someone near you. Say good morning. Welcome to Epic, and then you may take a seat. All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Epic Life Church. I'm Devin. We are so glad you guys are with us today. 
If this is your first time here, we've got a gift for you called How Good Is Good Enough. It's our way of saying thanks for coming. It's on the back table as you walk out the main entrance today. Now, when you walked in, you should have got a black program. In there are going to be our message notes. There's also going to be an orange connection card. That is how we connect with you guys. That's also where you guys are going to sign up for things. And we got a lot of things coming up to sign up for. One of those is Ladies Bunko. Where are the ladies at in the room? I was kind of weak. Where are the ladies at? There we go. This upcoming Friday, Ladies Bunko, 7 to 9 here at the church. It is $10. Today is the last day to pay. You can't pay when you get there. You can't pay tomorrow. Today is the last day to pay. But this is a fun time for women to connect together, have some fun, win, uh, win some prizes, have snacks, uh, and just an all-around good time. And this summer, we got life groups coming up. Life groups are a fantastic way to connect with one another, just to build a community. We've got a lot of new people in the church, so this is a good way to meet new people. Now, we need some hosts. What that could be is a hiking group, a board game group, couples group. It could be anything you want. All we got to know is what day, what time uh, you want to do it during the week. If you guys are interested in hosting a group, it's very easy just sign up on the back of your guys' connection cards on what day, what you might want to do. Maybe you don't know what you want to do yet, but you know you want to host a group. Put that on the back, back of your connection cards uh, so we can get you all signed up and uh, have you host some people. Then we got baptism coming up. This is a great way to show people that you have committed your life to Christ, that this is the first opportunity to show everybody around the church that, hey, I'm giving my life to Christ. I'm fully committed to Christ. And uh, if you have not done this yet, we encourage you guys to sign up to, uh, for baptism here coming up on the 28th. Now pull out your notes and get ready as we continue our series, Got Questions. How are you guys doing today? Pretty good. Some of you guys are doing good. Now, I know a lot of you are like, I want to feel good, but I'm still tired. We, we addressed that a moment ago. But I just got to ask you this morning, how many, how many of you guys want to feel good by the time we're done here today? Anybody? Okay, so we're all in the same. So, like, with your best expression of, of noise, tell me how you want to feel at the end of the day. How are you guys doing? I like that. I'll go with that. It's awesome. How many of you in here in the room um, are golfers? Do we have a few? We got a few. A few. How many of you guys were like, I'm not really a golfer, but I'm a hacker? Anybody? No? Okay. That's me. Okay. Some of you guys are like, golf what? You don't even know what the game is about. Let me, let me just share with you. The game of golf, actually, when it got started, started with 17 different rules that basically explained how the game was played. And a long time as, as it developed along the way, it turned into, uh, right now, about 34 rules. So it doubled in rules. But if you really want to dive into the, the variations, there's over 150 variations of the rules for the game of golf. For instance, and I learned this, because I'm, I'm a hacker. I, I like going out and like just whacking the ball as hard as far as I can get it to go. That's kind of my game. And I've never got any training, but I just like nature and it's fun to walk around whacking a ball around the course. So I didn't know this, that if, if, you're, if you're playing an official game and you're in the tee box where the tee markers are, if you're even one inch in front of those tee markers by accident or otherwise, and you tee off from that position, it, it'll cost you two strokes. Ouch. That is painful. If, if you hit the ball into a water hazard, like a pond, a lake, a creek, or otherwise, that'll cost you one stroke. If, if you're, and this is painful, if you're in the, the deep rough, and even you're like you're on a hill and you're trying to figure out how to hit your ball out of it so you don't lose a stroke, and you swing at that ball and completely miss it with the intent to hit it, it'll cost you a stroke. That's, and if you're, if you're like me, you're like, no, no, it doesn't. 
prove it. Liked how I play. Yeah, and, and someone just said the word mulligan. Okay, let's talk about this. Golf etiquette. There's this thing called a mulligan. And now it doesn't work in an official tournament, but if you're playing, you know, weekend warriors, hanging out with buddies or whatever, and you want to have a, a game that's casual and not so like straight by the books, you can do what's called a mulligan, which is you swing and you don't like where you hit it, so you like mulligan and you put your ball. I found out there's a guy, like it's, it, there's a couple different variations of the story, but there's this guy by the name of John Mulligan who used to reset his God. So everyone's like, I'm calling him Mulligan, like John did. Um, but anyways, uh, you can do that, and it, it basically it's like it's forgiveness. Like that stroke never happened. You get a little bit of grace there. And I found out in the etiquette for the, the game of golf. Now, I don't know if you guys play by this etiquette. Some people are like, well, everyone gets one Mulligan or two, whatever, per round. And you have like rules for but the, the actual etiquette goes like this, that if someone else paid for your game, like they're the ones who's kind of fronting the bill for everybody's green fees, that when you hit the ball, it doesn't go anywhere. Everyone's head turns to that person because that person is the right because they're the one who paid to call a shot. Mulligan, go ahead, try it again. They get the right to call that because they're the one who actually paid for you to be there in the first place. But there's all these rules around golf because golf expects you to follow these rules as any sport to, to basically make sure your score reflects your performance, okay? And every sport has its set of rules, but it seems like every aspect of our life, not just in sports, seem to be governed by rules. There seem to be rules for just about everything that we do. And I don't know that that's always a bad thing because even the simplest game would be no fun without rules. In fact, I was talking to um, a student this week who I meet with every now and then, and, and I was asking him, I said, how is your week going? Oh, it's going good. I said, what, anything fun going on this week? He goes, well, my brother is going to be playing a flag football game. He's in flag football league. He's going to be playing flag football this Saturday. I'm like, really cool. Tell me about that. His brother's five. He says, he goes, well, it's interesting because they don't have a coach yet, and they've not practiced at all before. None of them have ever played, but they have a game on Saturday. I'm like, can I come watch that game? That would, be, that would be fun. Any game that doesn't abide by a set of agreed upon rules is not fun. It's like, it's no point to it. It's like, just get out there and run around and scream. It doesn't really matter what you're doing because there's no real point to this whole game. Rules are not necessarily a bad thing, but we have a tendency in our life, we have a tendency to believe that restrictions and boundaries are barriers to the things that we want. They get in the way of what we would like to see happen, the outcome we're looking forward to, or the way we would like things to go. Obstacles to our freedom. And we live in the land of the free, right, in America, and we value our freedom. Don't, don't put me down with some kind of rule. I want freedom. Give me freedom. That's what we cry for. We have a message today. The topic today is why can't I just live my life my way? Why can't I? And honestly, in the world around us, in, in America specifically, the Christian church is known as being narrow-minded because of all the rules and restrictions, and it's so limiting to the, the way life could be enjoyed that if you live life that way, you're going to have a miserable life, and there's a lot better ways to do life other than the way following this book with all these strict regulations about what we're supposed to do. Why can't I just live my life my way? It's a good question. Why can't we? Um, back, back when the pandemic had, was, was sort of on the tail end, it was sort of winding down, theme parks in um, California, after a year of being closed, decided it was time to start opening up limited rides outside. And so they decided, all the theme parks together decided that the way they're going to do this, because they wanted to make sure they weren't spreading COVID, was that on roller coasters... They would fill every fourth row. So there'd be three rows between people to make sure they're spread out. And, <laughs> this is great, and they had a rule, you can't scream out loud on a roller coaster. Good luck with that one. In fact, Disney, and I quote, said, you need to, we encourage you to scream in your heart. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> That's going to happen. And, and honestly, when we hear things like that, something inside of us just wants to rebel. And we're like, really? What are you going to do if I scream? What? <laughs> Or stop me. And we like to, we get defiant. We want to be like William Wallace in Scotland and be like, freedom! Like, we're going to do it our way. You going to try and stop me? Come on, give it a try. That's what we want, isn't it? We don't want someone else telling us how to live. What do we do? Kevin Myers, in your notes, said this. I love this, the way he puts this. We say that we are anti-rules, but the reality is... We don't want to get rid of the rules. We just want to be the ones who make them. Hmm. There's a lot of truth to that. 
It's not that we are anti-rule. We just don't want other people's rules imposed on us. We want to be the one who gets to chart our own path. In fact, that's probably why Frank Sinatra's all-time hit, I Did It My Way, is so popular. Because we want to do things our way. When someone tells us what to do, they're trying to rob us of our independence and our freedom and ultimately our joy. They're trying to make life um, less enjoyable. We want the intimate privileges of marriage without the commitment of marriage. We, want, we don't want to, when we get tied down in our finances, we see generosity or being faithful in our giving to God as debilitating. We, we start to see rules and guidelines given to us by God as cramping our style. We start to view God as some kind of cosmic killjoy. All he cares is about just like, like, like stifling out every bit of fun that we have in life with all of his rules and regulations. What if those rules that God set for us were designed by our creator for maximum fulfillment and enjoyment? What if those guidelines and guardrails were actually motivated by love, not by control? So we're going we're gonna to explore that today. So I encourage you to pull out your notes if you have them with you. If you haven't got them out already, look like this in your program. Get those out as we're walking through. I, I just want to start off talking through with you guys three popular beliefs in culture today, in our society that, that I think sometimes guide the direction we go when it comes to this topic. The first one is this. Number one, God's objective isn't what's best for me. In other words, God's agenda is quite different than yours. He has a different end game in mind than you do. He probably wants you to live in poverty, to be unhappy, to go and be a missionary in an underdeveloped country. Whatever it is, you fill in the blank. It's whatever you don't want to do. God's, God's goal in my life is that if I want to be faithful to him, is I've got to be a miserable person. That's how it works. I've seen it. I've heard the rules. It's all about how miserable he can make us, and it shows how faithful and dedicated we are to him by how miserable we'll let our lives get. Don't think that's true at all. What God actually wants is for you to reach your full potential. He created each one of us for a purpose. Think about that. Over 8 billion people on the planet, not one of them exactly like you, and he has a unique design and a purpose for your life. In fact, we learned in the book of Ephesians, Paul writes to the church in ancient Ephesus. He says this, we are his workmanship, his handiwork, his masterpiece, his work of art. God made us beautiful, and he wants to use our life for maximum potential in fulfilling the purpose he created us for in the first place. And by the way, the way you find maximum enjoyment in your life is not by doing everything crazy and fun that you want to do, but rather by living out the, th the thing that you were intended to do with your life. That is where you find ultimate satisfaction. The deep, lasting joy that lasts, that comes from actually fulfilling the purpose you were created for in your life. In your notes, even the author Jeremiah who is a prophet, echoes this sentiment when he says this. He says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster. Do you hear that? God's plans for you are good, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. God knows your whole life, not just what's happening with you now. And I think we get stuck sometimes in the here and now, and it's all about what's going on in my life right now. God sees the big picture. He knows what, you, what you're experiencing right now is not the end of the road. It's merely a bend in the road. And a lot of times we get stuck with these bends in the road. And we're like, ah, this is the end. This is it right here. God's like, no, 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 no. Hold on. I can see beyond this point. If you'll just trust me. If you follow what I say, I will lead you through this season of life. Like a loving parent, his agenda is always what's best for you. So that's the first thing. Here's the, the second popular belief we have in our culture today, and that's this. God is too controlling of my life. All he wants to do is control my life. He's a control freak. Like some of us, if we admitted honestly to ourselves, are. We are control freaks. And so we believe he's a control freak. His rules are just so he control, can control every part of our life. Like I said before, he's there to be a killjoy. How many of you guys in here are parents? Kids of any age. Okay, a lot of you. If you're not, listen carefully because you're going to learn something that you might, maybe otherwise wouldn't know. Parents, when they're working with their children, trying to raise them up and show them what path to take with the best of intentions and desires, and we don't, let's be honest, we don't get it right all the time. We make plenty of mistakes if we're honest with ourselves. But our heart, our intention is to do the best thing we can to set up our kids for success. But if you're a parent, you know this. If you're not a parent, listen up. The kids, they don't see it that way. 
The kids think that you're there to sabotage their life and make it as miserable as you possibly can with every rule and restriction you've placed on their life. If you were a child at one time defiant with your parents, and probably most of us fit in this category, and then you became a parent, one day a light bulb came on, you're like, <laughs> I see it now. I'm understanding what was going on all this time. Just because you're in a position to not understand the full context in the picture does not mean that you know that everything that's happening to you is all for your bad. What you think might be for bad is actually something God may be working out in your life for good. But you've got to trust him. You've got to see it through, just like a child trusting their parent. I can't tell you how many times when my daughters went into their tween and teenage years and I can reason with them and have good conversations and they ask why, I ha why I have, we have a certain rule in place. I'm like, I, I can tell you the reason, and I have. You still don't get it. Can you just trust me? One day, you're going to look back when you have kids and you're going to say, oh, just trust me. I know you won't get it now, and I know you just trust what I say. And they don't, but one day they will. That'll be where the vindication comes. One day, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, a little taste of your own medicine there, I see. When I was younger, like really young, I think I was about four years old, I had an older brother who was probably at that time five or six, he's a year and a half older than me. And my mom and dad were gone, and they left us with a babysitter. And we had been instructed to go to bed. And in bed, every night, as always, as boys do, we would jibber-jabber back and forth and goof off, and, and she'd keep coming in and telling us to be quiet. At one point in time, my older brother decided that he was thirsty and needed to get, go up to the bathroom to get a drink of water. And I thought, that sounds like a great idea. So I shouted him. I followed him into the bathroom. And I was so annoyed as my brother, under the faucet, turned the water on very slowly. And I was just like, this is the stupidest thing. And I remember, I'm four years old, and I still remember my mindset to this day. I remember how idiotic that he's taking so long to fill the water. You can turn the faucet all the way on, and it'll fill up ten times quicker. And he got his drink of water, took it, said, here you go, and walked out. Probably in his head going, <laughs> this is going to be fun. And I was like, idiot. I had a babysitter in on me in like three seconds. I'm like, where did you come from and how did you know? <laughs> had no clue. My brother knew something that I had no clue yet because I didn't have enough experience and un enough awareness to understand that if you turn the water on full, it makes a lot more noise. And he was quiet enough and I was not. There are times in your life as, as parents where your, your kids don't understand. You know something they don't know. You're trying to help them. They don't get it. But if you say it to them, they, they fight you, they buck it. And the only way you're going to get them to follow is to say, because I said so. And as a parent, you may have been in that spot. We laugh. We get humorous about this. But isn't that how we as adults are sometimes? where we get so arrogant or so self-sure about something that we're like, no, no, I know the full context. I've got enough experience. This is the, what's right for me. This is what I need to do. And God's like, no. If you just trust me, you'll see. You'll see how it pans out in the end. Do it my way. Trust me. This is for your own good. How many parents have ever said, this is for your own good? But we don't trust God when he says, this is for your own good. We don't believe him. And how many of us, me included, have been like, no, no, let me show you how it's done. And they were like, <sighs> afterwards, it's like, okay, I see now what you meant by that. Okay, that makes sense. You see, rules are designed to allow you to get the most out of your life. Boundaries are there not to hamper your style, but to protect you and ultimately give you the freedom that you actually long for. Why do parents have boundaries, rules, and restrictions? Simply because they care. Parents care about their kids. They care so much about their kids, they'll even go beyond their kids' uh, perception of liking them or not and say, I don't care if this makes you upset. I know it's best. It would be actually cruel of me to give you your own way so you feel like I'm a good parent now when I know inside that what you're going to do is fall on your face. Unless, of course, it's one of those lesson moments and you're showing them by, by their own experience, okay, now will you trust me? But we have these boundaries in place because there's someone who cares about us. Wise parents have tight rules and restrictions with their kids when they're early, young, you know, very young. It's like, how, many, how many parents with a two-year-old are like, yeah, go ahead and cross the street if you'd like. If we don't do that, here's the keys to my car. I remember when I was young, around the same age where my brother and I went in to get that drink of water, we were waiting for my mom in the car in the driveway, and I don't know, if we, had, we didn't have the keys or anything, but somehow we bumped the shift, or it was a stick shift, into neutral, and we're like, what's this button here? And dropped down the emergency brake on a hill, and backed the car in, well, with us inside of it, down into a busy street, which was the, in front of our house. Luckily, no car hit us, but we're not aware. And if you give a child 
the keys to your car before they're ready for it, that is a disaster. Even if they want it, even if they're mad because you won't give the keys to them. Your 15-year-old's like, what's the, I'm, I already know I can pass the test right now. Why can't I drive? We know better. We're not always right, but mostly right. But here's the thing. We have a heavenly father in heaven who's wise. And, and as we grow in understanding and wisdom, we, we start to find loosening, loosening, loosening restrictions. But he never gets it wrong. He always knows what's right for us. Look what, what Jesus himself said in Luke chapter 16, 10. We know this principle. He says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So as our kids are growing, we're, te- we're letting them test the boundaries. We're kind of testing, laxing up rules and seeing how they respond. And then we as parents set up rules or release them accordingly when it seems like our kids are maturing. This is a healthy pattern for parents because boundaries in, in our children's life actually foster security in them. It's actually a good thing. These are your children, and as a parent, you get to make the rules and establish the boundaries. And we just got to remember that each one of us is God's children. We are all God's children. So as our Heavenly Father, guess what? He gets to make the rules, the boundaries, and the restrictions. He gets the one to set up consequences when we disregard his, his expectations for us. That's not controlling. That's love. You know that because if you're a parent, you know when you're trying to control your kids, you're not trying to control them. You're trying to show them love to set them up for success. And here's the thing. God didn't make us robots. If he did, then, you know, we would just be following along whatever track he put us on. Or if we were puppets, he'd be pulling the strings. But no, he gave us free will. The opportunity to choose for between right and wrong. And then he gives us some guidelines and says, you can do anything you want, but if you're wise, you'll follow these guidelines here that I set up for you in my word. See, when a child becomes an adult and has their own kids, somehow the rules of the parents start to make sense to them. And they're like, uh, I, I, I got to tell you, as a parent, I have learned so much about my relationship with my heavenly spiritual father from my relationship with my kids, from the perspective of dad with my children. I'm like, oh, okay. This is making a lot more sense now. Okay, God, I'm sorry. I'm going to work on that one. And we learn from that. As a child, they don't understand why you won't let them eat everything that they want. They don't understand why you're restrictive about the kids you allow them to hang out with and get close to. They don't understand why there's a 10 p.m. curfew. All of these rules, just because you're just mean and you want them to have a a really unsatisfying life, right? And then they become their own parents. They're like, it's all making sense now. The boundaries were motivated by love after all. Here's the last popular belief in our culture I want to share with you, and that is this, that God doesn't know as much as I do. Now, you probably wouldn't say this out loud, and you might not even think it in words in your mind, but subconsciously this is true, and the reason we know that is based on your behavior and your attitude. You look at your situation like, God just does not know my situation in the context like I do. Or, I've heard this, this is, the, this is the best. When you talk to someone like, I know what the Bible says, my situation is a bit unique. <laughs> do you hear yourself say that? Your situation is not unique. There are eight plus billion people on the planet. Someone, many someones, have been through the same situation you're going through right now. God understands your situation. You're not the first one to feel this way, by the way. The devil, called Lucifer, was one of God's chief angels in heaven. And scripture actually points out to us what happens to him. And if if you have your Bible, or if you have the Bible on the Bible app, pull that out right now and open up right now to Isaiah chapter 14. You see, Lucifer thought that he could be as good as God. He was like God. And he actually set up a revolt, basically to say, come follow me instead of God. He got cast out of heaven. In fact, you can hear what he says in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. The prophet Isaiah records these words. This is, this is God sharing with Isaiah, who, which he writes down, how Lucifer fell from heaven. Verse 12, how you are fallen from heaven, O shining star, son of the morning. You have been thrown down to earth, you who destroyed the nations of the world. For you said to, you, to yourself, I will ascend to heaven and set my throne above God's stars, I will preside on the mountains of the gods far away in the north. I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the most high. 
And he didn't stop with that. See, he actually, in the form of a serpent, met with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and he actually got them to believe the same lie that he bought into. That God is, is, is un, he's not confident in himself, and he's worried that if you get to know too much, you're, that he's, his job, his role will be threatened by you. Satan said that in the, in the Garden of Eden. He said, God's, God's, God, God doesn't really have a problem with you eating this fruit. He's worried that if you, if you eat this fruit, you're going you're gonna to be like him. You're going to think like him. You're gonna have an, he's trying to suppress you. Do you want to be suppressed? No. So Adam and Eve ate the fruit. And what started out with this, this Edenic paradise with Adam and Eve in this perfect relationship with God with one rule, don't eat that one fruit, turned into 10 rules, the 10 commandments, which turned into 613 Old Testament law uh, guidelines that had to be followed throughout scripture. And isn't that the way it works in life? We see this in America, that we have a few rules, like there's the Constitution that kind of is a guiding document, and then there's the Bill of Rights, and then there's some amendments, and then there's more amendments, and then there's addendums, and pretty soon you have law books this thick, because everyone, here's what everyone wants to do. Everyone does not, doesn't want to get caught breaking the rule, but still getting to, to, to exercise the freedom they want to by finding finding a loophole in the rule itself. And so guidelines have to be made, well, here's a stipulation on the rule. Here's what we meant by the rule. And here's what the spirit of the rule is so that we can follow it. And so you have these very legalistic, very specific descriptions of how to follow this law because we always look for the loophole. Because we want to be able to not get in trouble for breaking the law. So we have to follow the law, but still get to do what we want to do without hampering our freedom. Proverbs 14, 12, wisest man who ever lived penned these words, there is a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. We think we know the right way, but it ends in death. Think about that for a moment. Do you really think you are better than the one who hung the solar system in its place in the heavens? If you do, you're putting yourself equal or above God. And let me ask you this question. Do you really want the responsibility of God without the power of God in your life? Or can you be satisfied with the responsibility he's given you and some limitations because we are limited in the power that we have? He knows what's right for us and he knows how to lead us down the right path so that our life can, can yield maximum enjoyment, fulfillment, effectiveness, all for his purpose realized through our life. We've looked at three popular false beliefs in our culture that kind of lead us down this path of, of saying, I want to do it my way. Now I'd like to look at our, the remainder of our time at three reasons that I, I want to give you that I think we can, can follow to live God's way in our lives. Here's the first one in your notes. Whoever creates the universe gets to make the rules. Seems, seems logical to me. The problem actually comes when you ask the question, do I believe that God created the universe? Are we off? There we go. If we struggle, someone's turning me off. Sorry, God. Oh, better. Um, if we struggle with, with believing that God created the earth, I want to invite you back next Sunday as we walk into some stuff I've not talked about before that I think is going to be powerful that helps you understand, can I really trust the Bible? So if that's you, hang on. Come back next week. You do not want to miss this one. But for now, let's just assume that what the Bible says is true Go back to the very first verse in Scripture. It starts the whole book. Genesis 1, chapter, chapter 1, verse 1 in your notes. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There it is. And I've heard it said before that if you can believe the first verse, first verse in the Bible, it makes it possible, possible to believe everything else. Because if you can believe that there's a God in heaven who created all of the heavens and the earth, it's not so, poss not, not so difficult for him to create a flood and tell a guy to build a boat to float around and the whole world floods. It's not so difficult for God to say, I can turn a, a boy's lunch into enough food to feed 5,000 men, not including women and children, on a, on a side of a mountain. It's not so difficult to believe that there's a God through his son Jesus was able to heal the blind and the leper and raise people from the dead. That stuff's easy to believe if you can believe that there is a God who created the heavens and the earth. But, you, but if, if there is a God and he did create the world, then he's the one who gets to call the shots. God is all-powerful. There is only one Messiah in the universe, and guess what? You are not him. Plain and simple. Here's the second reason that I believe we can live God's way, and that's this. Obedience to God's rules will always lead to freedom. Obedience to God's rules will always lead to freedom. And I think 
intuitively, but we believe the opposite to be true. That if I follow rules, I'm going to be restricted. I will, I will be losing freedom because I'm following rules. But said another way, I could say the statement that rebellion to God's rules will never lead to freedom. We actually know this intuitively because we've seen it play out in our lives. Let me share with you several examples. For instance, the Bible warns us about the dangers of getting in financial debt. Proverbs 22, 7, the wisest man once again says, the borrower is servant to the lender. Anybody in here like being a servant to the lender? If you've ever been in a lot of debt, and then you've gotten out of that debt, you understand there is bondage in debt and there is freedom out of debt. I remember the day that my wife and I were able to pay off my final student loan payment and we were debt free. The, it's just like, and I've talked to other people who have felt the same way. It's like a celebration. It's like this relief. It's like, I'm out of debt. I owe, I owe nothing to nobody. And yet, the, the large, vast majority of America is in debt up to their eyeballs. Robbing Peter to pay Paul, switching from credit card to credit card just to try and make sure they don't default on loans and payments. We see it in Scripture. God's rule actually leads to financial freedom. Here's another example. The Bible warns us about sexual intimacy. The world says sleep with whoever you want, when you want. No one should put a hamper on that. We had this sexual revolution back in the 60s and 70s, like that Judeo-Christian narrow-minded thing that, that sex is, is for the context of marriage. No, 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 no. That is just going to make life miserable. You should be able to be free and do whatever you want when it comes to sexual intimacy. The Bible says this, save yourself for, the, for that one person and talks about faithfulness and the sanctity of marriage. Proverbs 5, here's Here's Solomon, that wise man again, says this, drink water from your own well. In other words, he says, share your love only with your wife. Keep that relationship sacred and pure. And it's not just, by the way, it's not even just the Bible that points this stuff out. Culture points this stuff out to us too. You know, I, I just looked up, just I was just curious what I'd find. I looked up in Psychology Today on their website, an article called Sexual Satisfaction, Does Marriage Help or Hurt It? Hurt it? Here's what they said in a secular study. Studies generally agree that compared with people who are single, cohabiting, or separated or divorced, those who are married generally report greater happiness, more emotional contentment, more spiritual fulfillment, and improved sexual satisfaction. Goes on to say considerable evidence shows that the greater satisfaction with life in general and sex, I'm sorry, considerable evidence shows that, that far greater satisfaction with life in general and sex in particular Marriage is the way to go. That's not from the Bible, folks. That's from secular culture. Studies prove this. Studies back this up. I've actually read articles in the New York Times that backs this same thing up. The Bible's been saying this for thousands of years. And we've challenged it so many times. And we think in our own minds, I can get away with this. And I know what's best for me. And I know what will make me happy. But, but God says, no, if you follow my way, I promise you, it'll lead to freedom. And it'll lead to more satisfaction in your life. Author and pastor Chuck Swindoll said, the grass always looks greener on the other side of the fence, but it's poison. A loving God put the fence there to protect you. Here's my final example. During, during COVID, we know this because we, we, we've talked about it a lot, that before COVID, we were already in a mental health crisis in America. But COVID just like put the cherry on top of things. And people really were having a struggle mentally. Mental health was, was just in the toilet. I want to show you something. This was a, a poll done by Barna in November of 2020 comparing mental health, in, you know, health, mental health wellness in 2019 to 2020. Watch this. And in, in, in we'll just start off with the, the demographic of gender. Males before the, the pandemic were at 49% well-being. After in, in, in the first year of the pandemic, 41%. It dropped by 8%. Women dropped a full 10 points. How about let's look at another sector. Household income. So it even affected affluence. It didn't matter if you were rich or poor in between. Those making under 40000 a year dropped six points. Those who were in the middle class range, 12 full points. And by the way, I don't have the statistics for the people who made more than 90000 but it isn't pretty. Okay, moving on to the next one. Age groups. It didn't really seem to matter what age group you're in. They all dropped significantly. Nine points, eight points, and nine points. And let's go to the next one. Race. 
Didn't matter if you were white, 10 point drop. And even if you were non-white, that dropped by eight points. I want to show you something interesting though. Look at weekly church attendance. Out of all the 14 different demographic areas that they surveyed, the only one that went up was people who attended church weekly. Do you see the people who attend monthly or are seldomly? There's almost no change down significantly, 12 points and 13 points. But those who attended church weekly, four points. If I were to translate that, what I would tell you this, and I've been saying this a lot, I've been beating this drum a lot, that, that infrequent church attendance does very little for your life. You have to make it a consistent value in your life to be there as often as you can, weekly if possible. Because you see the difference on that screen there, even if you attended once a month, which by the way, the average church attendance across America right now is one and a half times a month, not much more than once a month. You know what that means? 18 Sundays a year. 18 hours to lift you up and show you God's way compared to everything else that you're faced with in your life all year long. But if you attend church every week, your, health, your mental well-being goes up. You know what it says in Hebrews chapter 10? I didn't have to read these statistics. We could have just gone back to the Bible. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people. This isn't your notes, by the way, but it is on the screen. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. And by the way, those who attend church weekly, we found this in the pandem pandemic, that it was a nice stopgap to be able to watch online, but church actually happens in community when you get together life on life. The value of the community to get together. It wasn't about hearing a great message. By the way, if you want messages far greater than the ones that I deliver every week, I can give you a half a dozen churches across America who would school me in what I'm saying right now. Well, far more interesting, and you would never have to leave your house. But I'm telling you, the value of church community has nothing to do with the message you hear, but about the community you do it with. You have to be in community and you have to make it your priority if you want to see God, God improve your life. And yet, we go, but it's a nice weekend. And it's Oregon. We don't get a lot of those in the springtime. Oh, that's such a hampering of my freedom. I'm going to church. It just kind of spoils the ability to go out of town. I promise you, from someone who has gone to church every week for my whole life, you will miss out on nothing. You will gain something. So here's just some examples that I want to share with you, though, that God's rules actually lead to freedom. One last verse I want to give you. These are the words of Jesus, John 8, 32. Here's where you find freedom. He says this, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. This is not in your notes, but it'd be worth writing this down. A lie believed to be true will affect your life as though it is true. If I believe... When I'm dating, that my wife did not want to date me, so I didn't ask her because I knew her answer was no. It affects my life because I didn't ask her and it, I would never get together with her. What you believe, whether it's a truth or a lie in your mind, plays out in your life. You actually become a self-fulfilled prophecy in whatever you think to be true. Have you heard the phrase before, those who think they can and those who think they can't are both right? Because you act as though what you believe to be true, as though it is true. It affects your life. A lie believed to be true will affect your life as though it is true. We all want freedom. The Bible teaches that freedom is found in Jesus. Freedom was brought for, a, brought for us, bought for us rather, through the sacrifice of Jesus. Do you think this sounds too good to be true? I talked to many people. And one of the biggest struggles that I know right now that people who are, are people of faith and those who are exploring faith struggle with is believing that a God in heaven could love them when they know what they've done. You might be in here today and this might be exactly what you needed to hear today. There is a God in heaven who loves you more than you could ever imagine. Who went to such great lengths that he gave his one and only son to pay the price ultimately for your sin. In your notes, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. If you're searching for freedom in your life, I can tell you this with confidence. All roads to freedom lead to Jesus. 
He is the one who sets you free. How do you accept his freedom? How do you surrender to him in life so you can receive the freedom that he offers? The author Paul says it this way in Romans 10, 9 in your notes. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's all there is to it. And as you're looking at your notes, you may be asking yourself, didn't he miss number three, the third reason? To give you the answer to the third reason, I want to go back to the game of golf we talked about earlier. You see, we, we talked about how proper etiquette on a golf course is the one who paid for everybody gets to decide who gets the mulligan. And I want to, to pose for you today in your notes, the one who pays the price gets to determine who gets the grace. And I can assure you, Jesus has paid the price. You know what a mulligan is? I screwed up, but I get a do-over that doesn't show on my record as though it never happened. And Jesus is the one who gets to offer those. So when you mess up in life, you know where you need to look to to find out if you get a get-out-of-jail-free card? You look to Jesus. And you're reminded in Scripture, he says, nothing can separate you from my love. All have sinned and fall short of my glory. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And he offers that to you today. If you're someone who came today and you say, I'm a follower of Jesus and I'm doing everything I can to walk toward him in my, in my walk, could I challenge you with something today? Would you think of and find one person this week that you can go to and share your story of how you got a mulligan? Tell them what God did in your life, what you, how you messed up. Be willing enough to be transparent and vulnerable and say, here's what happened in my life and here's what God did. And I promise you he'll do the same for you as well. And if you're here today and you've never crossed that line of faith, never made a decision to say, Jesus, I want your forgiveness. I want that mulligan. I surrender my life to you today. What did Paul say? He says, openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. That's all there is to it. And I'm going to offer you that, that, that opportunity right here in a moment. Before I do, let me just give you one final statement. You can live life your way or you can live life God's way. You decide. Would you bow your heads? If that's you today and you want to make a decision to cross that line of faith, to receive God and his love and his forgiveness in your life, I'm just going to say a quick prayer. And as I say this prayer out loud, I invite you to say it along with me in your heart. It goes like this. Jesus, thank you for loving me so much that you gave your life for me on the cross. Thank you for paying the price for my sin. I believe in you. I believe you came to this earth, that you lived a, a perfect life. You died on a cross. And then you rose again. So today I surrender my life to you. I receive you as my Savior as, and as my Lord. I declare that you are God in my life. I'm giving you control of my life and I'm going to follow you completely. Save me. Change me. And give me power through your Holy Spirit to live my life faithfully for you. Today I put my faith in you and as in, these, in your name, Jesus, I ask this. Amen. You can look up if you want. If you just made that decision, what I want to tell you is that is the best decision. You won't know it yet. Best decision you've ever made in your life. God is going to do something in your life if you continue to pursue him and follow him and, and follow his guidelines for your life. You will see things beyond what you could ever imagine show up in your life. Blessings, favor, and fulfillment. So if that's you this morning, would you check the box on your orange connection card that you received in your program earlier? The one Devin was talking about looks like this. Backside of that first next step. Check that box there. And then on the front side, if you'll at least get your name and your email address printed legibly, we would love to send you some resources that can help you know what a best next step would be in your faith. In fact, 
I will just name one for you. We are baptizing in two Sundays. And one of the best things you could do if you just said that prayer with me is sign up today on the card. There's a spot for it in the, the sign me up for section for baptism. We'll send you all that you need to know. In fact, I'll, I'll give you a call and, and have a conversation with you. But we'd love to celebrate that special moment in your life. So if that's you, sign up and check the box for that. But we'd love to help you take next steps and see God do wonderful things in your life. That really is our passion. And for the rest of you guys, don't leave here today without thinking and determining your heart. There is an action step that I want to take. Let me point out one, the third one there. Today I choose to live my life God's way in, and there's a spot for you to fill a blank. What is the area that you are struggling to live God's way that from today you're challenged to say, I'm going to give this one a shot. So today I choose to live God's way. And that you don't have to write that word in there, but check that box and you know what that word is. Determine what that area is in your life that you want to live God's way. There's a couple other next steps you can look into as well. But I want to uh, prepare you that the team is going to come forward in a minute and they're going to pass a bucket by your row. So this is your chance to get, get prepared. If you have an offering to give today, you can get that ready. There's an envelope in your program that you can use that looks like this. If you Feel free to use that or whatever method you want. Of course, there's some online options there on the screen that you can follow if, if you didn't come prepared to give an offering today, but would like to. But while you're getting your connection cards finished filling out, all the information that sign me up for, us, all your information that's changed, make sure you get that on there. While you're doing that, I want to share with you a couple things that are going on uh, in two weeks. The same day we're baptizing, we actually have two student events. If you are a parent of a high schooler or if you're in the room and you're a high schooler, we have an event on April 28th after the service. It's movie and pizza. We're actually coming over to my house, and you're going to hang out with my wife. Not me. I won't be there. But you're going to hang out with my wife, and you're going to watch a movie, hang out, have some fun together, and have some pizza for lunch. But if you're a, a middle schooler here, or you're a parent today of a middle schooler, take note. Because that same day, we are doing Nerf Wars. Yes, we are turning this 8,000 square foot warehouse into a Nerf war arena. I've got my Nerf gun right here. Apparently, I'm going to get, I'm going to lose. Oh, what did I just do? I think I just shot that into the heater. Okay, fire hazard. Someone turn that heater off. Okay, all right. Oh, man, that's how it fires. Okay, all right. My dad's back there. Oh, shoot. How about Angelica? Get ready. Here it comes. I'm not really good at aiming this thing. Anyways, we're going to have a Nerf war, and I am no holds barred. We're going to have a lot of fun in here. So uh, if you have a middle score, make sure they get signed up for that. Sometimes they hear about these things, by the way, in their class, but they're not the best at communicating this to mom and dad. So we tell you in here so you can sign them up and encourage them to come. It's a great way for them to have fun and meet a few friends. I know a lot of times middle schoolers and high schoolers in this season of life are feeling a little bit insecure about getting to know people. It's a wonderful way for them to connect and get to know each other. All right, I'm going to ask the team to come forward. And while they're coming forward, would you bow your heads and pray with me for as we pray for the offering. God, thank you so much for how you bless our life. Thank you that you set up these guidelines in your scripture because you love us and you want the best for our life. One of them, God, is that you, you, you ask for us, God, to be generous back to you. So as we're generous today, God, take the offerings we give and use them. Use them to change lives of other people around us. God, let our offerings be used above and beyond anything we could ask or imagine. We give them to you today out of a glad heart, a, a, gl a heart of worship and gratitude. In your name we pray, amen. All right, watch for the bucket as it passes by your row again. This is your cue for the orange cards or offering. If you got one of those or both, you can put those in the bucket now. While they're passing those around, I would love to invite you back. I, I love it when the calendar year lines up on certain events. We just did a St. Patrick's Day celebration a little over a month ago. Guess what? There's another one coming up. And we look for every opportunity we have to be able to do a party. And so we're going to do Fiesta Sunday on Cinco de Mayo, which is coming. Oh, yeah, we got some power out there. Coming up on May 5th. And we'd love to have you join us. It's an, it's an excuse for a party. We're going to have, uh, have pinatas for all kids, ages preschool, middle, or uh, elementary and hill, high school, middle school. We'll put them in a safe place where they're not whacking people with sticks. But it's going to be a lot of fun there. There will be some prizes. We're actually going to, um, we're going to, I can't remember what we're doing for drinks and for donuts. But we also, at the end of the service, there will be taquitos for everybody who wants to stick around and enjoy a taquito on us. And I think limonada will be there as well. So you don't want to miss out. It's a fun day. Plus, if you're a volunteer, 
volunteer, and many of you are. This is Volunteer Appreciation Sunday, and we've got a special gift for you that day. So if you show up, we would like to show our appreciation to you for, uh, for your volunteering. In fact, by the way, while you've been in here enjoying this service, back in the kids and student spaces, there are about 15 to 20 volunteers who made this possible. If you see them, if they were with your kids, Think, think to say thank you to them today. They're investing in, in the lives of your kids, in eternal investment in their lives. They're, they're giving a lot of, of their time. They were not able to be in the service today because they're back there, so it is a sacrifice. But make sure you thank them for their involvement. But come back on Fiesta Sunday, and we will get you a volunteer appreciation kit if you are one of our volunteers. Now, I want to invite you back to next week. I mentioned already we're going to talk about the question, can I trust the Bible? I have done a lot of research on this over the years, and I have a lot of stuff to share with you. I can't share all of it all of it with you, but I got some stuff that's fantastic that I think is going to encourage you and maybe open your eyes up. And if you are skeptical about whether or not you can trust the Bible, you need to be here. And if you have a friend who's like, well, you know, you guys follow this really old book that's kind of fell from heaven 4,000 years ago. It's kind of weird. I'm not into that. Bring them with you because I will open up their eyes to some misconceptions and some myths that they might be believing about what scripture is. So come back next week yourself Bring somebody with you and let them come and, and be, able, be able to experience and feel and, and hear the love of God for them and the gospel message. Invite your friends to come with you. And then the last thing I want to share with you is, man, there's, I love it when the room is full of so many people in this room. Every Sunday I stand out on the patio and I say, have a good week. Bye. Enjoy the week. And it's like a really quick, like, that's it and bye. See you later. I want to get to know you guys better. And if there are people here who maybe today's your first day, all the way up to like you've been coming for like six months, I would like to get to know you a little bit better. And so after the service today, if you'll stick around, we have a new to Epic meet and greet. Even if you didn't get a chance to sign up, I would love for you to stick around. It'll be in the lobby. We'll be setting up there in about 10 or 15 minutes after the service ends. And we'd love to, a chance for me just to kind of share a little bit of my story who I am, share about my family, and also get to know you a little bit better, and then an opportunity for me to share to you who, who Epic is, what we're about, and what we are on the move. We are doing some great things coming up in the future, and so I would love to let you in on a little bit of that. So if you'd like to stick around, there will, there'll be snacks for you, and if you have kids, there'll be child care provided. They can just stay back in the kids' space. So I, I want to in invite you to be a part of that. Would you stand up with me today? Where, whether you stick around or you're on your way out of here, I hope you have a wonderful week. Enjoy your week, and we'll see you back here again next Sunday.